invite Dr. Josh Smith from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to the podium and he will give us an update on rectal cancer. Okay, good morning. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, preserving the rectum. If you don't talk about uh, preserving the rectum in this day and age, you're gonna go out of business as a surgeon. So I'll um, argue a little bit with Sam. I don't think that there's any um, worry that uh, we're gonna run out of uh, patients to operate on in this current day and age. This is uh, my list of disclosures, and here's my overview. I'm gonna talk about the problem of rectal cancer, the surgeon's dilemma, which I think is now becoming the medical oncologist dilemma, to be perfectly honest, and, and including the radiation oncologist dilemma. A review of the data, old and new, and total new adjuvant therapy, Oprah, and what's new. And then I'll pause um, in places where I think there's some a smattering of data from uh, both old GI ASCO, um, new GI ASCO, and ASCO, where I think there's some relevant data to discuss. So rectal cancer is coming for our patients um, we estimate about 46,000 cases this year to treat, and we see this skyrocketing in our patients that are less than 50. I just treated a patient last week, um, a 20-year-old that had a vert because of unresectable disease in the pelvis. So total knee adjuvant therapy, I think, is also here to stay. These are six studies. Uh, five of these I'll cover later on. The sixth one I'm not going to cover. But this is the idea of chemoradiation and chemotherapy all before the idea of surgery. Um, supplanting the old um, adage of giving chemoradiation and everybody going to surgery and getting adjuvant therapy. Now we know there's some tumors that are resistant to chemo, some that are resistant to radiation, and then we know that there's some mysteriously that just disappear like this, where it just looks like a normal rectum. And we need to figure out how do we best identify these patients. And the challenges remain, as I show you here in this um, black um, line that's this skyrocketing in patients that are less than 50. And our patients look like this. This is one of my patients. And the issues that remain here are that, you know, sexual function, urinary function, you know, this patient does not want a stoma. She doesn't want to uh, interrupt her job where she goes back and forth to Europe uh, to deal with the, the treatment issues that we uh, typically introduce for our patients with rectal cancer. Our patients aren't, you know, 60, 70 um, year old uh, uh, patients anymore. So we want to reduce the risk of distant metastasis, preserve quality of life, and identify sustained responders. These are the challenges for us. Surgery is no free lunch. Even in this day and age, mortality can reach 1% to 5%. There's complications from chemoradiation and radical surgery, bowel obstruction, urinary uh, incontinence, sexual dysfunction, problems with defec defecation, the large syndrome after chemoradiation and surgery, and of course, a permanent soma in up to 30% of our patients. We know from gold standard randomized trials that there's excellent local tumor control in the pelvis, but these treatments with chemoradiation and surgery are associated with significant morbidity, as I just mentioned, and there's variable tumor response. Sure, you can get a pathologic complete response after chemoradiation, but it comes with a price. So do all patients need this aggressive multimodality approach? So there used to be a dilemma, you know, if we made a tumor disappear, do we watch those patients? And I think there's a, a second layer to that dilemma now. It's really what happens when you know, the tumor comes back and is, can we identify these patients and better identify those who we would not offer a watch and wait approach to? I think that's really our, uh, the dilemma 2.0 now. So Professor Habergama is the one that really introduced this more than 20 years ago, essentially almost booed off the stage when she originally presented these data, showing us that clinical complete response is associated with possible cure that you could defer surgery and that surgical salvage when tumors did come back um, in terms of local regrowth was safe and there was no differences in overall survival when you compared those who had radical surgery versus those who underwent uh, a watch and wait approach. This was subsequently um, shown in recently in the International Watch and Wait Database published in The Lancet showing that tumor regrowth is about 20 to 25 percent, which is very consistent when you look across multiple retrospective series. Overall survival is quite good. You are missing some salvage surgery data because you're looking at multiple institutions across the world, but the local regrowth rate is pretty consistent at about 25%. If you have a local regrowth, the distant metastasis rates are a little bit higher, 18% versus 8%. And then a recently updated series when they looked at patients less than 50 versus greater than 50, the local regrowth rate's very consistent, 26 versus 24%, no real significant differences. Now this is also happening in Asia. They're, they've looked at our data and they're using more of a consolidation approach, meaning chemoradiation and then chemotherapy. 
The local regrowth rates are very similar. They're managing patients mainly with distal tumors, so distance from the anal verge here is four centimeters. The local regrowth rates are a little bit lower, 15%, but most of, most of those local regrowths are within the lumen of the bowel, which is very consistent with our data and also with the um, data in the watch and wait database, but no differences in oncologic outcomes, as you can see from the survival um, curves and the distant metastasis-free survival curves on the, on the bottom uh, right panel there. So what's our experience? So we published the off-protocol results um, in 2019. This was 1,000 patients, about 900 of them um, went to surgery, and then 113 had a clinical complete response that we watched, managed by watch and wait. Now you have to imagine that this was in the era a little bit pre-MRI, so some of these were managed by endoscopy, ultrasound, um, and what we saw is that some of these patients did have a local regrowth, but managed um, all of them with uh, salvage surgery about five to six weeks after it was detected with a 91% pelvic control rate. The tumor regrowth rate, as I showed you in the International Watch and Wait database, is about 20%, with a disease-specific survival of 90%. All of the local regrowths occur, as you can see on this swimmer's plot, within the first um, 12 to 24 months. And all of these occur in the bowel wall. Very rarely does it occur in the mesorectum. And so you have to have patients who come back. They have to know that this is something that requires surveillance. And what we did note here is that we saw a higher rate of distant metastasis in those with local regrowth, which is consistent with the International Watch and Wait Database. And recently they published a, an update to their Watch and Wait Database showing that there is a higher rate of distant metastasis in those with local regrowth. But my argument here is this is probably biology, not necessarily uh, related to the approach of doing watch and wait, and we'll find out more about this as we um, get data from the OPRA trial, which I'll talk about later, in addition to other trials that have integrated watch and wait into the trial design. So we've been able to do an induction approach. That means chemotherapy followed by long-course chemoradiation at um, MSK. And what we've seen is very interestingly parallels what I'll show you later in OPRA, a 40% uh, clinical complete response rate with an induction approach. You can see the very high rates of disease-free survival and overall survival in those patients managed by a watch and wait approach with very low rates of local regrowth um, when we do this approach off protocol. Dr. Weiser, who's one of my partners, asked the question really, could we manage patients who have a path CR in a similar way that we manage patients with a clinical complete response, meaning no tumor in the bowel wall, and using a clinical calculator that he developed um, for colon cancer patients to predict recurrence-free survival, could you do that in the same way with locally advanced rectal cancer patients? And this is looking at outcomes at 12 months in those who had radical surgery and had a path CR versus those who had a clinical complete response and had a um, evaluation for recurrence free survival using all the factors that you might look at um, to predict recurrence free survival. And what you can see when you look at three months after TNT versus 12 months after TNT, the top two curves are the patients who had a PATH CR versus a CCR. And you can see that those two um, curves are essentially the same. So a CCR and a PATH CR, at least in our early data at 12 months, seem to be very similar and behave very similar in terms of oncologic outcomes. So what about quality of life? If you look at case match studies versus patients who have radical surgery versus managed by a watch and wait approach, and this is just our series, also mirrored in a series and other series from the Netherlands, we see that the bowel function indices scores um, for patients who are managed by a watch and wait approach, we see that they have better bowel function indices scores on all the subscales, so dietary, frequency, and urgency, and soilage scores. So patients who keep the rectum in seem to have better uh, bowel function indices, which is a little bit intuitive, but it's, it's better to collect the data and, and show it. So what are the limitations of the evidence of watch and wait? Well, clearly these are retrospective uh, case series. The denominator is unknown. These are really um, done in research-rich settings. There's non-uniform definitions of response, short follow-up, inconsistent surveillance protocols. A lot of the studies were done in the era pre-MRI and variable patient selection criteria, so really a lack of um, gold standard data, lack of randomized data. So what about systemic chemotherapy um, before surgery? What are the perks of TNT? So this idea of putting everything up front. And I would argue that you could treat micrometastatic disease sooner, improve treatment compliance. If people go to surgery, you can get the ileostomy closed sooner, enhance response to the primary tumor, and this can, of course, be given before or after chemoradiation. So this is... Um, emblematic of a lot of work that's been done by um, people in Europe, people here, 
Um, I'm just showing a few examples here. This is um, Dr. Fernando Smartes in Spain, who published his original paper in 2010 in JCO, showing that you could do induction chemotherapy. Um, and then, of course, our work at MSK, and then also Tom George, who recently published in um, JAM Oncology, showing this approach is, is safe and, and can be done uh, effectively, meaning putting chemotherapy before chemoradiation and radical surgery. But of course, all these patients have to go to, go to surgery in this model. What Dr. Sursik showed in this JAM Oncology paper is that if you use this TNT approach, the complete response rates are higher. Of course, all these patients, uh, most of these patients went to surgery. And then in an updated analysis, what we've shown is that the complete responders have better outcomes in terms of disease-free survival, whether you had chemoradiation and looked at PATH, you know, PATH plus clinical complete response or a TNT approach. So what about the prospective TNT data? So this is an, a consolidation approach, which is introduced both by the Brazilian group and our group. This is the uh, timing trial uh, that was led by uh, my clinical mentor and uh, leader, um, Dr. Garcia Aguilar, where you take chemoradiation and this standard approach and turn it on its head and do chemoradiation, chemotherapy, and radical surgery. And here you can see a concentration, inc concentration dependent increase in pathologic complete response. Of course, all these patients went to surgery after um, chemoradiation. This is long course chemoradiation and increasing doses of Fulfox. And this was also then modeled by the German trial group, so a, a very strong uh, clinical trials group that compared induction chemoradiation, um, chemotherapy followed by chemo long course chemoradiation compared to chemoradiation followed by um, uh, consolidation chemo, and you can see an increased path CR rate in the consolidation group versus the induction group. Everybody went to surgery, low toxicities, and um, then their, their long-term oncologic outcomes were no different in the two groups, suggesting this is a safe, safe approach. Tom George led this um, the trial. This is NRG G002. Uh, this was the TNT trial that accrued very nicely across the United States, a very important trial showing that TNT can be done safely. And the idea here as a platform trial is that you could add things to the um, TNT approach to try to increase the response rate. They looked at NAR, which is essentially similar to a surrogate for path CR. And I'll get into a little bit more of the data here, but this was a really important trial um, that we were hoping would show higher response rates. Um, but there was, on the initial uh, analysis, no differences in NAR scored comparing uh, full fox and long course chemoradiation compared to full fox and, and pembrolizumab. He recently presented this at um, ASCO GI, and what you can see is the past CR rates, although numerically a little bit different, were not statistically different, and the clinical complete response rates also were not significantly different. The sphincter preservation rates were not significantly different. And if you also looked in the PARP uh, inhibitor um, arm versus the pembro arm, no real significant differences in the past CR or the clinical complete response rates. Interestingly, he saw an overall survival um, change in the pembrol arm, but I think this may be a little bit of noise. We'll see if this pans out. And these are the data at about three years. So an important trial to show that you can do TNT. We don't see any signal as he added in the radiosensitizer PARP or pembro, but again, an important trial to try to increase um, response rates in our rectal cancer patients um, as we move forward. One interesting note here, there was a lot of young patients in this trial, um, and these were mainly low um, aggressive rectal cancers. So the Rapido trial, which another important thing has been now read out, was comparing a short course approach versus a long course approach in a TNT fashion. The primary endpoint was disease-related treatment failure. And what you can see here is they did meet their primary endpoint of improving disease-related treatment uh, failure rates at three years and also um, reducing the rates of distant metastasis with a TNT approach and then also um, increasing the path CR rates. You can see this was updated at a European Surgical on, uh, Oncology meeting um, in 2021, and then recently they published this in Annals of Surgery. The interesting thing here is you can see that the local regional uh, failure rates are higher in the TNT arm, um, although they still have a lower rate of distant metastasis, but in the um, short course group, there's higher rates of local regional occurrence, 10% versus 6%. From a surgical standpoint, um, you can see these are all um, tumors that can be rescued. They're presacral, they're anterior, they're at the anastomosis, so if you need to take these patients back, you can do this safely. Um, so I'm not too worried about this um, in, um, from a surgical standpoint, but it is notable that the, uh, the local regional occurrence rates are higher in the five-year follow-up for Rapido. 
So Prodige, I think, is a really important trial from the French group using this triplet versus doublet approach. This is an induction TNT-like approach. And the reason they used Folfox at the end here is they just couldn't get the, um, the French medical oncologist to agree to a pure TNT approach at the time. I think now they could. Here they did see a difference in the disease-free survival, metastasis-free survival, and of course, past CR rates went up using this approach. And this is an important study that I'll allude to later. So the OPRA study led by Dr. Garcia Aguilar was across the US and Canada, and I think a game-changing um, trial in many ways, although it didn't meet its primary endpoint of disease-free survival, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So this idea of in enhancing the, the tumor response with radiation timing has been around for a long time. This is the original, one of the original chiefs at MSK for the colorectal service where they use radiation to try to um, make the tumor go away. This is a paper from 1929 in the Annals of Surgery um, using um, radiation, and then they said, well, we'll just supplement with surgery if we need to, um, almost 100 years ago. And this is Professor Habergama again, where they've used this idea of chemo radiation followed by chemo, and then um, a watch and wait approach if the, if the tumor goes away. So this idea has been around for a, a little while. The idea here is that you um, use response to guide um, your treatment choices. So this is radiation, um, and then watching it, you can see how radiation affects the tumor right away. So this is an endoscopy one week after, and then mid chemo, and, and then after chemotherapy, and you can see the tumor melting away. So what about the optimal design for a watch and wait trial? Well, we know that we could design a trial like this where the tumor is gone at the end of treatment, but if I got everybody in the room to say, okay, now you don't have a tumor in your rectum anymore, but now I'm gonna randomize you to an APR or, or not, I don't think anybody in the room would do that. And we know by asking our patients that there's no way they would do this. Um, and then this is my patient that I showed you earlier, and I, I'm not gonna show you the video because she curses in it, um, but there's, <laughs> She says there's no way she would do an APR or, or go with this design. So this is the design that we settled on, which is essentially induction versus consolidation. And the reason this works is because you're saying that there's a chance um, that they can preserve the rectum. So if they have a complete response, they go to watch and wait. If they don't, they have radical surgery. You can see the patients were very well matched here, um, advanced tumors, low tumors, and mostly node positive tumors. We use this regression schema, meaning no tumor by MRI, endoscopy, or exam. Of course, if they had an incomplete response, they had to go to surgery. They're recommended to go to surgery. And the surveillance protocol, as you see here, this is modified a little bit as we move forward, um, but it's very simple. And um, if they had to go undergo surgery, they were managed by a NCCN guidelines. Surgery, you know, sometimes we missed it. Sometimes we thought they had tumor there and they did not. That's why the pass CR rates are similar there, 8% versus 9%, but the R0 resection rate was very similar in both arms. Here's the money slide. You can see at um, three years, the consolidation group, there's 50% organ preservation versus 40%. We predicted when we wrote the trial that this would be 35 versus 25. So this was a big change and, you know, obviously good for patients. Half of the patients with rectal cancer are now preserving the organ with no differences in oncologic outcomes. You can see the difference here at three years, it plateaus out. Local regrowth rates also plateau out at two years. You can see it's higher in the induction arm versus the consolidation arm. The consolidation arm is um, in, um, in red versus blue for the induction arm. And we saw no differences in disease-free survival rates, whether you went to surgery up front versus late. The timing of surgery was seven weeks if you went to surgery right away versus 30 weeks versus those managed by watch and wait. And the sphincter preservation rates were very similar, which is important. So what did we learn from Oprah? Well, tumor response takes time. The response to TNT is much higher than we hypothesized. And delaying response, uh, assessive response is important and allows the biology to declare itself. And I, I alluded to that with the picture I showed you earlier. So what do we also learn from OPRA? So if we incorporate a treatment strategy where there's TNT, we get uh, complete responses in more than half of the patients. We originally hypothesized it would be about a third of the patients. So that was a surprise for us. But that was important and important for patients and I think also their quality of life. We know that watching weight is acceptable to patients. OPRA accrued a year and a half, almost two years faster than we anticipated. And successful watching weight, in, uh, you really need a well-informed patient and patients have to come back uh, to comply with, compl um, with surveillance. They have to come back for the surveillance exams. And we knew that from the off-protocol studies, but OPRA confirmed that. So this is how, how it works. The patients are diagnosed. 
They were randomized to consolidation or induction, and you can see there's a complete response on the top, a near complete response, which we know that some of those evolved to a clinical complete response, and they can still undergo watch and wait. Obviously, if it's a, a tumor there at the end, they have to undergo surgery, or we recommend surgery, although some patients can refuse that. Uh, we can't force anybody into surgery. This is the way it looks in picture form. You can see the complete responses on the left, the near complete responses in the middle, and of course, I think um, you know even uh, my children can see the, the tumor on the, on the right. That one has to come out. So why is this important? So these data are now um, soon to be in press, but these data suggest that a clinical complete response um, correlates with uh, outcome, and I think this is a really important point. And this has also been supported by data um, from the uh, MD Anderson group and others, but you can see there's really no differences in the um, patient characteristics when you look at those who have a complete response versus a near complete response or incomplete response, so we can't really find this out by just looking at the patients at baseline. But this is da these are data from MD Anderson, these are data from the German trial. These are all patients who went to surgery, so no tumor in the specimen. You can see beautiful disease-free survival curves, complete responders do great, Near complete responders do, eh, and then incomplete responders do poorly. So here are the data again from Oprah. Complete responders do quite well. Near complete responders in the middle. Incomplete responders do poorly. If I superimpose the German trial, it's essentially the same, okay? We're seeing the same thing. Whether you take the rectum out, you leave the rectum in and watch a complete response, you see the same pattern. So what do we learn here? The grade of response um, seems to predict organ preservation and oncologic outcomes. The grade of response is also similar to a pathologic response in terms of outcomes, which I think is an important point. And patients with a near complete response, we can give a little bit more time, but if they don't convert to a complete response, those patients need to go to surgery and need to be followed closely. So now I'll kind of end with where we've moved forward with the next set of trials. So the Janus trial um, is a trial that we used, um, you know, a lot of data from patients, a lot of data from competing trials, and then of course uh, building on the Oprah trial and of, of course Tom's trial and others to try to figure out what's the best trial to move forward into the, um, the space uh, that was available to improve patient outcomes. So we heard a little bit before about chemointensification for pancreas cancer, um, and now what about how do we maybe use that for, for rectal cancer? So I told you about the timing trial. And what we see in the updated data from the timing trial is there is an association with improved disease-free survival as you add increased doses of Fulfox, but what about um, using a triplet approach? Well, this is being studied in high-risk colon cancer. This is the Canadian trial that's doing it. This is Arvind Dasari's work using this in terms of a ctDNA approach. So patients who are ctDNA positive are being randomized to triplet versus doublet uh, chemotherapy. This was alluded to earlier with um, Dr. Parikh's work um, with patients who have are cDNA positive being uh, put into a full theory versus an observation arm, which I think is a really important trial. And we know from the French group that patients who have metastatic rectal cancer that the that responses can be improved with a triplet approach. You can see with eight cycles of um, fulfirinox versus um, not that you see an improved uh, response both in the metastatic tumor and in the rectal primary, and also the patients felt a lot better um, after the treatment. And in Prodige, I'll just highlight again, this was the, so far the trial that's met all of the primary endpoints, and the five-year data is going to come out soon. We may see it at ASCO. I guess we'll, we'll soon find out. Uh, but all of the uh, endpoints with the triplet approach have been met in this trial, which I think is impressive. Now, we asked the patients, given the data from Oprah, given the data from Prodige, what would they, what would they do? Would they rather receive more chemo, more radiation, and by a resounding amount, 80% would prefer more chemo versus more radiation. I mean, this was not a signal-to-noise problem. I didn't have to, like, recheck the surveys. They were adamant about this. And there were data from the, the Netherlands group and also from the, the Dutch group suggesting, you know, maybe we should give more chemo radiation to increase responses. Uh, the patients didn't care. They said, we'd rather do more chemo than radiation. And this was a multi... Uh, disciplinary group that helped me with this, and uh, a paper will come out to describe this soon. In addition, the Canadian group has um, shown that um, there's, you know, even if there's a risk for local regrowth and an APR, patients are willing to accept that risk of oncologic decrement at a fourfold higher rate than, than clinicians are. So I think this is something that we need to pay attention to. 
So this is the Janus trial. It's a randomized phase two trial building on Oprah. You say, well, why is it, is it not called Oprah Prime? Well, it was called Oprah Prime. There were a lot of different names, but Janus had to be used because that just means a new beginning because we had to scrap about two, you know, 20 designs before that. But this is the way that, this is what we settled on with CCR as the endpoint. So triplet versus doublet using a consolidated approach. Happy to discuss this later, but it's, it's now open and accruing, and I, I think that it will, um, think and hope that it will accrue quickly. Um, so who will be managed by Watch and Wait? This is very similar to OPRA. Patients who have failed to achieve a CCR will be recommended to go un undergo um, surgery. And of course, it's not mandatory. We can't force people uh, into surgery or Watch and Wait. If they have a clinical complete response and they want um, surgery, they can do it, but I think that will be a, a rare event. The surveillance protocol is very similar. This is along uh, the lines of the NCCN guidelines. Um, so for billing purposes, you're not gonna run into any issues with this. And the NCCN guidelines have recently been updated to follow this exact surveillance protocol. So from a billing standpoint, it's not gonna be an issue. So isn't Janus just this? Isn't it just big versus bigger? And I think the Europeans would argue this. So this is uh, Professor Buchko. So the Europeans say, you know, Josh, what the hell? What's this TNT stuff, you're just over-treating patients. But I think you just saw data in the pancreas setting. I think I just showed you data um, with uh, Fulfirinox also from Europe, from France, showing that the primary endpoint in Prodige has been met on uh, three fronts, including past CR. So I think the jury's still out there. So what about short course? Well, we know that WashU, using a consolidative approach, has shown that you can preserve the organ using a short course approach. So these are the data. It's fairly provocative, but there's no comparator here. You can see the one-year organ preservation or TME-free survival is about 40% here. So we um, at ASCO GI published our results here. The, the paper will come out. Um, but we saw that in long course, we see more organ preservation versus in short course. Um, when you look at just those managed by watch and wait, that seems to pan out. So I think that you know, this question will be answered by this trial. So this is watch and wait at the end for those patients who have a CCR versus no CR. Um, patients man essentially randomized to Rapido, the winning arm of Rapido versus Oprah. So this is um, consolidative chemotherapy after long course chemo radiation. Of course, the Germans use oxaliplatin as a radiosensitizer, which is a little controversial, but nonetheless, that's what's, what's happening. You can see here, this is uh, Manus Focus who presented this, and you can see how fast this is accruing. You can see from this curve that patients want to keep their rectums. Everybody wants to keep their rectum, and you can see it from that curve. He's almost done with this trial. This trial opened less than two years ago. It's a 700-patient trial. I could probably just end the talk on that slide. All right, so it, paradigm shift in ongoing trials in rectal cancer. Prospect, it's gonna read out in ASCO 2023. This is a game-changing trial. You have to know about this trial. This is one of my patients, treated with the full Fox arm alone. It's a past CR. But the past CR there comes with some issues with surgery. Um, even with surgery and chemo alone, there's still large syndrome. So, um, but I think this will be a game-changing trial that, uh, that uh, Dr. Schrag will uh, tell us about. So to treat DMMR, rectal cancer nowadays, or colon cancer, your last name needs to start with C. So this is Dr. Sersek's trial um, that was presented and published. So I don't think I need to spend a lot of time here, but PD-1 blockade, tumor disappears. This is Dr. Simbor's trial, another really important trial, now integrating CCRs um, as an endpoint. And this is a, a really important question um, using CTLA-4 plus uh, Pembro, and I think this will also be another really important option for the patients, asking the question, you know, can we also use short course radiation? So I think we need to think about using this as an option for our um, uh, DMMR, MSI high rectal cancer patients. Here are the primary objectives. So I mentioned CCR now is, an, is another option here. It's in amendment, and she tells me it's in discussion. So what are the considerations? You know, the PD-1 blockade alone, now there's up to 30 patients in this trial with sustained responses at more than six months. As I mentioned, you need, your last name needs to be a C to study this. So Dr. Salabi's trial in colon cancer is ongoing with extension trials here. You can see waterfall plots like this. And so this brings up the idea about what about watch and wait for colon cancer, which is provocative, but I think it's going to come, come down the pike because patients are going to ask for it. 
And what about durability of response? We don't know. And then what do we do about salvaging these patients who then develop a local regrowth? I think what we do know from our own experience is that these DMMR uh, rectal cancer tumors are exquisitely sensitive to radiation, which I think is why Dr. Sambor's trial is, is an important trial that will learn some, a lot uh, about responses there. So what are the issues that remain for our patients? We need to improve survival outcomes. Quality of life uh, measures must improve. We need to identify, identify responders and the optimal TNT regimen, I think, is still, um, uh, there's still some questions to, to, um, to answer there. So watch and wait approach carries risk. OPRA was the first trial that shows that can be integrated in a watch and wait uh, trial. This is best done on protocol. I told you Janice is open. I'm happy to help uh, get patients on that uh, wherever you are. Um, the ideal candidates for watch and wait are those who have a sustained response. TNT uh, is a promising modality to optimize response. Consolidation chemotherapy after chemoradiation is the best way to improve that response. I showed you data from the German trial, Rapido and Prodige, to improve response rates. Those are all options for you. And then Janus, the new German trial, and these new um, immunotherapy trials for the DMMR patients, that's the game changer. You gotta check DMMR status in your patients. If it's a proficient rectal cancer tumor, they go to a standard uh, approach. If they're DMMR, they either need to go to the IO trial, uh, one of those options. So this is the way that we treat rectal cancer in 2023. It's a little complicated. You could still do the standard approach, but I think that's outdated, and you have to start talking about the way, um, you know, if you're not uh, managing patients with an organ preservation option in mind, they're gonna go somewhere else. And the idea um, that you can optimize response and potentially preserve the organ, I think, is, is here to stay. So I'm happy to, to share this um, with you and talk about it later, and I'll end there with a, just a shout out to the team at MSK, um, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, one question. Thanks, Josh. It was a great talk. A lot of data. So <laughs> it's great to see how we're moving forward in rectal cancer. My question is, and you touched on this a little bit, but practically speaking, when you're trying to get to watch and wait and you have this near complete response, you do imaging endoscopy at eight weeks and then up to eight weeks additionally? Or, because we're really kind of struggling with that timing in terms of how long can you wait before you really need to pull the trigger on TME? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we built in eight to 12 weeks in OPRA and we do the same thing in Janus. If they have a near complete response, we give them another um, four to eight weeks. We know that it's either gonna respond or not. I mean, the idea is that a clinical complete response it just keeps responding. So the tumor is either going to go away or it won't. Mm -hmm. And th that near complete response, you know, you see that little scar, that little erythema there, either that turns into a beautiful uh, pale white scar with telangic tasers or it doesn't. And so, you know, we've put in some hard stops in Janus because now it's going out to the NCTN across, you know, multiple sites, both academic and non-academic centers to make sure that that hard stop at you know, 20 weeks post TNT if it's not evolved to a clinical complete response. Because we, you know, it's, it's safer to go to surgery in those patients. I mean, if you have a past CR, you know, that may be, that, that we feel like that's okay. Yeah, 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 that's great. Yeah, yeah I think we're seeing more of the MRI with the near complete response. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's such a struggle because endoscopy, endoscopically you see that complete response or what yeah. you think is there and biopsy is negative, but the MRI is and, maybe And the other thing that we know is the endoscopy trumps the yeah. MRI and it yeah. takes time for the MRI to catch up. And we also know that from, um, and you'll probably, I think, learn that in your trial. And I think um, Andrea knows that from her trial that the, that the MRI lags behind the, the clinical exam. Yeah, Some, totally Sometimes agree. by a lot more than we're comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Great. again, Dr. Thanks. Smith. Next up, I'm gonna invite Dr. Nina Sam